Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior. is found far as far as the curse is found he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders Amen. Please have a seat. All right. It is announcement time. Good morning. For announcements today, tonight we got our youth group, 6 to 8 p.m. We've got tomorrow here at EBC, the men's small group. We're going through Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. Um, on, <laughs> on Wednesday at 3 p.m. to 4.15, we've got the Good News Club. That's here. Um, December 24th, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. is the Christmas Eve service. Um, today... We're going to be doing communion. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Uh, over here we've got the connect card and prayer requests. So if you uh, have any prayer requests or would you like to connect with us, then that's how you go about that. So let's go, right? Come on. Uh, actually, I'm a foster. <laughs> um, we're going to have that. Hello? Okay. At the moment, just, you know, if, if you haven't got your communion elements, so we still are going to be doing it kind of in the COVID fashion, um, they're available at the desk at, at, as you come in, the front doors, and also here at the back of this room. So we'll be doing that after the message today. Um, so we'll be somewhat ending with that and then before the final closing song. So let me hand this over. I can hold for you. There you go. All right. Our Savior is born. Today's candle is the shepherd candle, which is pink to represent joy and celebration. The shepherd, the shepherd da, shared the joy da. of Christ's birth. We can share with others the joy of his presence in our lives. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. As an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He will be assigned to you. 
you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Are you ready to light it? Uh huh? Here, let's set this down. Esther's going to talk to everybody. Like this one here. Nope, nope, nope. Now in there, go around to the other side. But that? When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Let's pray. Father, we are so happy to be in your house this morning um, here to celebrate your son's birth and um, the advent of that that we just uh, participated in the lighting of these advent candles and, and hearing about uh, just the advent of your son uh, coming to, to earth, Lord, to save us from our sins. So we pray, Lord, that uh, what we do here as we celebrate that um, just would bring you honor and glory, and Lord, that, that you would help us um, take that to heart, uh, take to heart our need um, for salvation, and uh, Lord, this is the time that we, that we celebrate that, um, that you provided a way. So, Father, be with us. Um, I also pray, Lord, for those in our church body who have needs um, or connected there too. Lord, I think of um, Katie Baldwin uh, Munene. She's in Kenya. Um, she has a need to get home. And Lord, you know all the details surrounding that, but uh, we just pray that you would work in that situation. Um, Father, also uh, for those in our, our congregation who um, have had surgeries or have health issues, we pray, Lord, for them that you would do healing. And uh, Lord, just meet their needs. And, and Father, for, for many other needs that we have, um, we pray that you would be attentive to us, and we trust that you are. And um, we trust that you meet those needs, Lord, as you see fit. And so we ask all this in your Son's name, the, the name of Jesus. Amen. So please stand with us as we continue with some more singing. Now the darkness is over 
No more wandering in the night Celebrate the child who is the light You know this is no fable God and manhood became one We see he's more than able And so we live to God the Son Celebrate the child who is the light Now the darkness is over No more wandering in the night Celebrate the child who is the light The firstborn of creation Lamb and lion, God and man The author of salvation Almighty wrapped in swaddling bands Celebrate the child who is the light Now the darkness is over No more wandering in the night Celebrate the child who is the light Celebrate the child who is the light Now the darkness is over No more wandering in the night Celebrate the child who is the light Celebrate the child who is the light He 
have a seat. All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Special welcome to those who are back with us and some settling into Coquille and settling into uh, our Oregon winter and settling into uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church. We strongly invite you and encourage you to take part in what is going on here. Uh, find out what is available to minister to you and your family, but also how ways in which you can serve and ways in which you can get involved in the things that we are doing both 
uh, here among ourselves and out in our community. Um, so as well as just to, to hear what's on your heart, what are your interests, and what do you feel you know, God's calling on your life is and how you believe he would lead you to serve uh, here and in our community because you know, God is a God of creativity and he is uh, very much uh, outside of the, the, the box or the norms and the, and the traditions of men. We want to find uh, exciting spirit-led ways in which God is inspiring and encouraging you to be involved in kingdom ministry. Um, just a couple things before uh, we get back into our, our, our current ongoing series, Christian, Who Are You? Um, one is, is that, you know, Darren had mentioned Katie Baldwin as, or Katie as he was praying, is Katie Baldwin Munain. Um, and as you know, for the last couple of months, um, they have been struggling there in Africa it, it, for a variety of reasons. And I really want to encourage you to, um, you know, increase your life towards them. And by that I mean to pray for them all the more, to increase your giving if you give toward their mission or uh, begin to if you don't. Um, there are also, uh, you know, funds needed to get her home, she and the children, to see her father. Her father, John Baldwin, was a pastor here uh, two pastors ago uh, prior to me. Um, he and his wife, Vicki, right? And, um, and so they are now in Wyoming, um, and John is suffering from a form of cancer, um, and man, I have been praying for several weeks now that she and the children would be able to get back in time to, to see her father and their grandfather. And so we just really encourage you to think about them more, love them more, reach out to them, encourage them, pray for them and support them, okay? Um, so God bless you for that. Also, man, we need to pray for, you know, the heartland over these last couple of days, Kentucky in particular. And I don't know if you've seen some of the overhead photos of before and after, and it literally looks like a large bomb had gone off. Ferocious, um, uh, you know, early winter uh, tornadoes that were devastating. And beyond the loss of life, there is so much else. There is injury and there's loss of everything and there's mass confusion and there's power outage and there's difficulties in everything that we generally wake up in the morning and take for granted. Um, so, man, be in prayer. Lots of, you know, Christian relief groups are flooding into Kentucky and surrounding areas. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up partially in Illinois, and I would see small tornadoes, never saw too much damage. I remember our neighboring community next door, Elgin, Illinois, um, the high school was completely destroyed. You know, some people rejoiced and others were heartbroken. Um, nobody was hurt, but the high school was completely destroyed. I've seen a little bit. But man, the photos that I see, I, I, I marvel at it. There's all different ways in which storm can happen. And tornado speeds are far faster than hurricane. And, and, they're, and the, the warning is far less. And, they, and, and their movement is so erratic. Um, just, uh, um, yeah, it's a reminder of a, of a fallen and broken world. And needs now where, you know, God's people can really step up and show love and compassion and generosity toward these folks. Um, just as we wish to do with the Baldwins, to show love and compassion and generosity um, to those who are near to us. Uh, 
The, uh, the slide for today before we get started says this. Do you, know it was his, do you know it was his mercy that woke you up this morning? Because his judgment should have killed you last night. Uh, another quote from Vody Balsham, a great pastor in the Lord and a mentor now of mine that I follow and listen to and read and such. Um, you know, mercy is the simplest definition, not getting what we deserve. And we deserve God's judgment. And the only reason we don't, if we're a Christian, because of the cross. He's already poured out his judgment on the cross. And we are absolutely in the clear because we are his and we have been redeemed by the blood and we are his. Um, for those that don't know him and still yet wake up each day, it's his mercy, his long suffering, his grace, his desire and patience that you come to know him before it is too late. Um, yeah. So we will be continuing today, and just who am I anyway, Christian, who are you? And with the overriding principle that remains that sin is the attempt to find meaning, to find identity, to find purpose, to make life work for me apart from God. And uh, last time we ended with a little bit about, you know, it, we talked about the light of the world, and so be lights in the world, uh, in this, the darkness of our world, and we're kind of like a light bulb that, that's, that's on amidst darkness. And that's not a very bright light, and it, but it, it doesn't take much the darker that it is. We can even see these lights here. They light up. If, we were to, if it were to become midnight, turn everything off, they would be all the more brighter. And for that matter, we probably all, since you know, God's given a grace, is, grace that differs, our maturity in him is different, uh, all the various factors that we all probably, if, if we could see with spiritual eyes and cut off the light, some of you would shine really, really bright, and some of us would shine more dimly. But that's okay. We, we're his, and, and, and we, 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 the light we have, we have to offer to the world around us. I also went on to say they were kind of like a lighthouse. And a lighthouse, and my statement was, is that a lighthouse is there, you know, to lead you to safety. Okay? But that's kind of in a roundabout way. And I referenced Jim and, 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 um, and, and you know, because he, he's a boatman. He's been out on these rough Oregon seas, and, and, he, and he clearly knows what, a lighthouse is. Well, he sent me over the week um, a message about lighthouses. And it's really great. It actually magnifies and multiplies the way that we can stand as a lighthouse. Listen to this. It says, they serve to warn mariners uh, of dangerous uh, opponents. You know, because our baseball team, the mariners, need a lot of that. No, it, it says this. Let me start over. It, they serve to warn mariners of dangerous shallows and, da and perilous rocky coasts. And they help guide vessels safely in and out of harbors. The messages of these long-trusted aids to navigation are simple. They say either stay away or danger, or beware, or come this way. So just like that, we too, we, we stand as lights that say, man, if you continue on that course, the, the rocks are going to take you out. Okay? You're going to get caught in the shallows and you're done. Okay? So we warn. And also that same light says, that's, it's out on the westernmost most point of a rocky area, and it says, you know, stay away from right here. But it also says that if, you know, you, to the north, often into the south, there is the safety of the harbor. And so we too want to direct people away from danger into a safe harbor. 
And the dangers are many, okay? I mean, life can mess you up in so many ways. And the safe harbor is Almighty God and all that He stands for. You know, His Word, His ways, His principles, His help for us to live out our lives and avoiding the perils of the rocks that we can't see, that we don't see in time or we don't see at all. So I found that to be edifying. I wanted to share that with you today. And so last time also we said, we, I'm going to run through these, these five principles of, of that, that were the things that functioning first generation Christians knew. They knew who they were and why they were alive. That holiness did not come about passively, but by the active participation of their wills. That the lordship of Jesus Christ was not an option. Not that I could have him just as savior and ignore him as master. That's a heresy. Uh, The Holy Spirit's presence was an experienced daily reality. The Holy Spirit, very real, not some ethereal thing, different from the Father and the Son. Absolutely just as person as, as they, and just as personable, and just as important, and just as much where there can be communication and His work in our lives. The work of the Holy Spirit, His presence, was a, a precious reality and, and was an experienced reality and something uh, that they were keenly aware of. Yes, sorry, I did not mention dismissal for uh, Children's Church today. I'm a, when my wife's not here at my side, I'm a little, uh, I'm, I'm not altogether here when she's not here because we are one. Um, she's still recovering from surgery and uh, is continuing to pray for her. She's doing well. Um, so they knew these things. And then finally, five, that the individual Christian was not an isolated pilgrim, but a part of a body which could not function apart from love. God has given us his son. That's even kind of Advent-like, right? God has given us his son. He has given us his Holy Spirit. He has given us himself. He has given us each other. And a lot of Christians feel that they can live independently. You know, all, you know, because I've lived much of my Christian life in Montana and in Oregon. You know, small town, rural Montana and Oregon. And man, where really tough, independent people live. And man, I encounter all kinds that say, I don't need church. I go in the mountains and commune with God. And I say, man, that's great as as an, a part of the mix, but you're not designed to be alone. And actually, you're in rebellion by being alone. God has called you into fellowship. The body needs you, and you need the body. Uh, we need one another. God, when God deals very specifically in the, the nuances and the things of our life and the things that trouble us, concern us, cause us fear or anxiety or whatever it is, he almost always intervenes in our life to meet that need through the hands and feet and mouths and words and love and heart of another person. It's God ministering to me But far more often than not, he uses other people of his to, and sometimes the Balaam's the others, you know, to to bring into our lives what we need to hear and experience. It's vital. It's a vital part of this whole idea of who are you and what are we here for and and, and, uh, knowing that we are this recreated child of God that's no longer just hybrid of the old person, but altogether new. I have this unredeemed flesh in which I continue to struggle with the issues of sin. And my brothers and sisters, we're all in that, and we need to be engaged in this together. 
together. Negotiating life, which is difficult. Uh, life just is, by definition, difficult. It's not like it's going to get difficult. It might get more difficult, but to some degree or another, and you might have it pretty easy in comparison to this or that, but life, by just the virtue of the fact that we, we, we have this sin nature, the fact that, that sin nature is in everybody else and abounds in those who are bent on evil and wickedness, life is difficult. We need first to, you know, as we talked much before in the last two times about abiding in the vine. We need, to, we, we need to be first and foremost in that genuine, vital relationship with Almighty God. And then in fellowship with His people. We are family. We have the same Father. We have the same spiritual blood. And we need each other. Yes. We talked about being like deep sea divers on the sea floor. And how that cable goes clear up to the boat where the big giant air tank is. Because he's, though he might look a bit like he belongs there because he's got weird clothes on and all this paraphernalia and this weird looking helmet and all the such he's not designed to dwell there his he knows his life is above because he's he's connected to the life source that's his umbilical cord to the life he's he's created for air and oxygen for us we are like that we are foreigners in a strange land and we and we really should we don't want to look like freaks and idiots but we need to look we are different we are unique and it needs to show in some way. And in the ways it needs to show is in that, whoa, people usually don't care about me like that. Not that it shows because, oh, look how righteous I am because like, damn your sin. It's no, you know, look, look how much that, that almighty God loves you despite your sin and so do I. And that we show that we're supernatural and we're different because the person goes, man, nobody has ever said that to me before. Nobody's ever done that for me before. Nobody's ever really seemed to love and care for me like you do before. Man, that's supernatural Jesus kind of stuff. And so we need to look and act differently, but we know that our life source is Almighty God. It's the umbilical cord to Him, it's the air cord to Him, it's the vine or the branch that's connected to the vine. Um, <clears throat> the scuba diver looks, looks otherworldly, and they know that they are otherworldly, you know, because they are, uh, they, here a scuba diver or free diver, is not of that world where that photograph. They are not of that world, okay? Just as we are not of this world. John 17, 16 says that straight out. Just as I am not of this world, Jesus says, neither are you of this world. Okay? And he is the pattern and the example for everything. Don't do what I once a long time ago did, and that was I only, I only saw Jesus as my example to a certain point. Because, oh my gosh, he's God and I'm not, so it's got to end somewhere. It doesn't. He is our example in all things. He has the resources. He's, a, he's born a human, and he, he is connected to the Father. He relies upon the Holy Spirit, and he gains everything through that connection to the Father. We have the same resources. We are like that scuba diver who is not of this world. John 17, 16. And one thing we can further say today is that I believe that they, they, they the early Christians, Christians in general, 
I think if we really are starting to figure it out, you know, we no, long, no longer see you know, meaning as being measured in prosperity. In, you know, and quite frankly, in the Old Testament, oftentimes indeed, someone who, who had large territories and, and had great belongings all kinds of livestock and servants and, and all of this just big going on. That was oftentimes a measure of the blessing and grace of God showing in the physical realm. But remember, we've said oftentimes, things in the Old Testament pretty much worked themselves out in the physical realm and had spiritual implications or applications. In our New Testament situation, that's sort of flip-flopped. It all starts with spiritual and biblical principles that, that oftentimes have a literal physical way in which they play out. Man, I tell you what, it is zero today to do with prosperity and with anything to do with material blessing, having anything to do with God's favor in your life. And these early Christians figured that out right away. How do I know that? Well, I see, we, I'm only going to go to a few, but there's so many places where you can go where it talks about how suffering is a good thing. And that's a real stumbling block for a lot of us because that's, it just doesn't make sense. Because for one thing, even though here, here's, the, here's the paradox, people, here's the stretch or you know, the, 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 the rub, I know for a fact through my relationship with God and his word that persecution, trouble, suffering, and all of that is good for me. But, but I'm not too willing to ask him for it. Isn't that right? And so it's like we know it's a good thing. It's like, but, but we don't go like, well, bring it on, you know. Find me somebody who will strap me to a tree and turn me upside down and set me on fire. No, we don't do that. And so, I think, you know, God and his graciousness and his, his infinite wisdom and knowledge that he, he says, you know, he knows me and you so perfectly that we don't have to ask for it. He's going to bring the measure that we need. Not too much, not too little. But listen to some of this. Um, I think we're right at that. Um, Oftentimes people talk about how, you know, the, the, the times of suffering is when people might say they're losing life. Whereas I, I, I see here that these, these early believers, it was just the opposite. It, it seemed like when suffering was happening, that life was pouring in. Suffering was like light that shined on life. James, James chapter 1, just verses 2 to 4, consider it all joy, my brethren, Brethren being a term for brothers and sisters. When you, so consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. And he, he gives us some why here, which is always helpful. Sometimes God answers questions and sometimes he doesn't. He says, hey, you don't need to know the answer. Just, you know, trust me. He says here, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your face produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, all of us are far from perfect. And so what moves us closer, never too up, all the way up against perfect, but what moves us closer to perfect is suffering. And trials and persecutions and difficulties. Because it produces in us endurance, it produces in us, and we can say, well, the pastors, you know, faith and, and, and hope and trust and, and the result that you may be perfect and complete. So it's moving us in that direction. That's why we need it, because we start out spoiled brats. 
snotty-nosed, spoiled brats. And God needs to discipline us and correct us and bring us to a place where we have come to, a, to maturity, where we have come to endurance, and when we are becoming more, we are becoming perfected, never perfect, in a, but we're, we're in the process of being perfected in Christ. Because what, doesn't Scripture say, be holy for I am holy? Be like Christ? Be conformed to the image of his Son? I don't have on here, but Romans 8, 28, you know, that very famous verse, what's it say? Something like, uh, um, uh, so weird, I'll just go blank. Um, say again? All things work together for good to those who know him and, who, that, who, and love him. And then the next verse says, verse basically, so that they may be conformed to the image of his son. That's one of the whys. All things work together for good. Sometimes we, we, we throw that scripture at people who are hurting. And by I mean throwing it, you know, we, just kind of, we don't hand deliver it with compassion. We just kind of throw it at them. Because scripture says so you shouldn't feel so bad because all things work together for good. You know, here, whack, they get hit with this. But hand delivered says, and from the Spirit of God, it says all things work together for good to those who know him and those who love him because, verse 29, He's in the process of conforming you into the image of his son. That is how those all things work together for good. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Then in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to, ob to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That really speaks of the assurance of the believer for one thing over and over again. Verse six, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, now it may seem like a long while, like those in Revelation having to suffer for at least 10 years, 10 years of suffering and persecution is a long time, but it's little in light of eternity, isn't it? L little in light of what compares for later. It says, though you may have to rejoice, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable. See, one thing that for, by you enduring trials is that it becomes a proof of your faith more precious than anything else. It becomes precious to the very person who's exercised that faith because they go, yes, Lord, I have seen you come through in my life with my little bit of faith. Other people can look and say, whoa, man, I have seen God work in you and I am really confident of your salvation and of your faith because I saw what God did in and through you in the midst of your trial. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. See that? That really is an attaboy. Verse 8, and though you have not seen him, right, faith, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him, or faith in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Life is not easy and it may get more difficult. And to whatever degree that we are failing to see this, and degree to which it is missing in us today, really is the degree to which holiness in our own lives gets gets inhibited, gets, gets hindered. 
Look now at Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I can't count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul lost everything and was beaten to the point of death multiple times. And he counts them but rubbish and that word there translated rubbish is just kind of a nicer term for what the word likely actually means. It is more like dung, right? Or, you know, it goes by lots of other names. I consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. His righteousness is because his faith in Christ, not because of his efforts to do right. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Wow, one of the really the most powerful statements that Paul ever makes in my view. Because he is clearly in this context, not just saying, oh man, I, I, I really can't wait until I get to you know, it, be a, a partaker with him in the power of his resurrection. But he's saying, because I died with Christ, because of being conformed to his death, because of the fellowship of his sufferings, you know, if, if I died with him, you know, he says elsewhere, I surely shall live with him. If I was buried in him, I surely I will be raised with him. So look at this again, verse 10. Oh, that I may know him. That's, that's, that's the first part. Do we have that passion? Do we say in our lives, oh, that I may know him. And not next go to in all the glory and splendor of his heavenly dwelling, but to say that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship of his sufferings means knowing them, the fellowshipping with them, being together with, experiencing them with him, being at one with that. So he's saying, may I know the power of his resurrection, may I know and even experience the fellowship of his sufferings, having been conformed to his death. That sounds like a pretty difficult life, and Paul's life always was. Paul's life shatters completely any notion of a prosperity gospel or of some sense of, of uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Man, these early disciples, it was everything but. They lost everything. Paul the baptizer was beheaded. Stephen was stoned to death. Many of the early believers were martyred and killed in various horrific ways. It's sort of the antithesis of prosperity. It is entering into the Christ. What was Christ as a human? When his, his, his last experiences were unparalleled suffering... So in view of the positive, which was Paul's desire, he considered his loss rubbish, okay? His loss rubbish. And he talks about, I mean, he really is someone who could boast. He had a lot on his resume, okay, of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, a disciple of Gamaliel. He was... Uh, you know, he had a lot to boast in. 
uh, in this life. And he, and, and he was willing to, he laid it all down because he, it, it compared to knowing Christ and him crucified, knowing Christ and his resurrection, knowing Christ and his sufferings, it compared to this, or perhaps even worse, to this. This is bear scat um, on a trail in Yosemite. Black bear, therefore. <clears throat> um, you know, I remember when I was, I, I was a much younger man, and even though I was a senior pastor of Jesus Community Church, I was only 31 years old. And I was the youth leader, and we had this group, and I used to do these things where I would go out and... Uh, um, um, I do some like on-site kind of things with them, right? So I did this little teaching of, of the narrow path. So we went out into a, the mountains and paths and wilderness. is so close, man. It's, it's un unbelievable. But we walked a little ways till it got really kind of narrow with the rocks on one side and the trees and, and, the, and the cliff to the creek on the other side. We talked about the narrow path. And then on the way back... We ran into black bear poop, okay, dung, scat, whatever you want to call it. And so it was just like, you know, then this was not the intended teaching, but I saw that and I went, whoa, this is too cool because I would want to do this again, but how, how often are you going to find, you know, and I just didn't want to use a nice, tidy, round, you know, frisbee looking thing that a horse laid behind for this. I wanted some. So here it was. We came upon bear scat. And so we stopped right there. And we all made a circle and knelt down around the bear scat. And we talked about this passage. And because consider, because <laughs> how often do we bring up the glories of our past? And I might be as guilty as anyone of that. Man, I talk about you know, the things. I, it, it'd be silly for me to give you a litany of them right now, right? But I would talk about this great thing that I did, this unique thing, this kind of amazing thing or whatever. Or, or you know, of course, our glory days, what we did in high school and college. Um, and, and, you know, or maybe even now it would be, you know, the things I did in preparation for ministry and education and missions and, and, and different things. Man, that was all rubbish or dung when we understand that our identity is Christ and being his Because those are my accomplishments. Now, some of our great accomplishments can be, be only because of him in us, and that's totally cool. But I shouldn't leave that on the screen so long. Some of you may be offended, and I apologize if you are. I thought I hesitated to show it, but I thought, well, no, if Paul's willing to talk about it. Man, those early believers knew that to say death to the flesh was saying yes to life. And not only to the glory of God, but also to themselves in the sense that they were partakers of that glory. They were joint heirs, Scripture says. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Joint heirs. Come on. It's like that should be one of the most exciting things that you ever hear. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Jesus is almighty God and everything is of the Father's is his. That's how he's the heir of all that is. Joint heirs with Christ. But also in joint in that, his sufferings. But if we share in his sufferings, we share in the cross with him, we also share in his resurrection, in the power of his resurrection, and it can be conformed into his image. So the Christian who really knows who he is, a Christian really who knows this, I think we can, we can truly be ourself without being selfish. See, oftentimes we think of, you know, when, when, I'm, when I am really being myself is when I'm, I'm kind of like, 
in the wrong place, and, and, and therefore everything I do is selfish. I'm just being myself. You know, we're all just human. But see, if we really understand who, who I am, who yourself, who his self, herself, himself, myself really are, then it's like, wait a minute, I can be who I am, I can really be myself without being selfish. Though we all remain a bit selfish, again, because of the unredeemed flesh within us, it's one of those things we attempt to beat down from childhood because we are born sinful, aren't we? We are born selfish. We are born demanding. We are born, you know, gimme, 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 gimme. If you don't, I'm going to hit you and I'm going to throw a fit. You know, it doesn't even take six months to begin to see demonstrative behavior in humans demonstrating their, their selfishness and, and, and their pride and their arrogance and their want and their serve me and do what I want, and, right? And so the process of maturity, even though the, the writer of Proverbs says, you know, discipline drives out foolishness from the child, discipline drives in wisdom into the child and there's this process of becoming less and less selfish. For those of us who are raised to be selfish, it's a horrible confession because when I came to Christ, I was severely handicapped in the discipleship process because I was one of those horrifically spoiled brats oh man I was and of course at the time everybody thought that was awesome man Ke Kelly's got it made because his parents give him everything say yes to everything and, and, they, and they got you know the resources to throw it at him and, and, and it's like wow isn't that awesome and you know and I foolishly thought so at the time as well but man when I came to Christ believing that, that, that being a Christian is one who obeys and complies and says yes and and, and follows, it was like, oh man, I was ingrained to be the opposite. And so there's my excuse sometimes for being so, you know, unsanctified in certain areas of my life, for what it's worth, okay? Um, the spiritual error that these early disciples, the, the context of what we've been looking at, and even disciples up to this present day that get it, is, is, you know, the spiritual air that they breathed was, it was fragrant with a type of liberty the world had never seen before. Instead of being polluted by legalism, these are the words of legalism. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. I'm going to go ahead and read this last passage that's on your list, but we're going we're to take up there next time in terms of, of kind of exposition of it. But I want to conclude here. The next text on your sheet should be Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. And you will see these exact words in this text. These are the words of legalism. And this is what Paul writes to the Colossians. It says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one take you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands 
the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Buried with him, risen with him. Verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. So all accusations against you, all other people's accusations against you, all Satan's accusations against you, what God do with them? Say it with me. Nail it to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over the, them through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which were a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Likely what was going on here was among the Jews that were saved and among the Gentiles that were saved, there was all this big dispute in terms of, you know, what of these things are we to follow and to what degree. And, 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 and they had all these different opinions and they were applying their opinions to others. And, and it was getting messy and Paul is speaking to that. But he says that they're a mere shadow of what is to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Verse 18, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. And so here it's saying, don't let somebody else defraud your prize by, you know, they're like the super spiritual person, right? Where they've got, you know, they, they hurt themselves to show, you know, the sufferings of Christ instead of it being a part of life. They, they, take, they speak about, you know, the, knowing angels and worshiping angels, which God would say not to do, by the way, taking his stand, stand on visions he had seen, and inflated without cause in their fleshly mind. So others, and I bet many of us have felt this, I have had people come to me in a way that is, is intended to make me feel as if, you know, I am completely off course in terms of living a holy life lifestyle and they have all these legalistic uh, requirements that they attempt to fulfill and seek to also then put us under the same burden of. He says, don't listen to them. If you have died with Christ uh, to the elementary principles of the world. Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use? Now, I suppose in relationship to this, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. But he's, you know, this is where they've got, oh, this type of drink, this type of food, this sort of thing. Oh, no, 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 the Christian would never. They all refer to things destined to perish in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Verse 23, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement, severe treatment of the body. But get this, they are of no value. It doesn't even say little value. It says no value against fleshly indulgence. Supposedly the reason this is done is so that I 
you know, really become a less indulgent person, but no, they have no value because they're not godly. They're not God things. They're self-made religion. And then a portion of verse of chapter three. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, here it is, folks. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated as the right hand of God. Seek the things above. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And I know that struggle. My mind wanders. My mind can wander to sinful things. My mind can focus. And and he's saying, keep your mind on the things above. You know, the things that are just good and wonderful and helpful and not the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Isn't that amazing to the extent to which we are hidden in Christ? Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And notice that most of these have to do with the lust of the flesh, sexually, and then greed. You know, sex and money, aren't those the two great pitfalls? For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked. See, there is a reminder. It's not, oh, look at me. No, don't look at me. Look at Christ. And in them you also walked when you were living in them. Verse 9, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. I would encourage you all to to this this last long long ish passage. Colossians 2, 6 through 3, 11, to meditate. I mean, mean, every day be in this text between now and next week. And uh, and we will look at it a little deeper. Let's pause for a moment. Father in heaven, as we share communion today, I pray that you would bring many things to our minds. We say to do this in remembrance of you, that we might remember some of the things that have been mentioned today. We might remember many of the things in which you've done in the past. We might even consider the things we are longing for in the future. We remember you, we remember what you did on the cross, we remember what you've done specifically in our lives. And... For that, we are grateful. And for that, you have made us worshipers. May we today worship you in spirit and in truth as we share in this most significant uh, right. I ask in Jesus' name. So, as you know, that on the day, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he went, met with his closest friends and they had Passover together. This comes out of the lengthy Passover Seder. What we now celebrate as communion is like a snippet. If you were to stop about two hours in and, and take about a, you know, a, a, a 10 minute portion where he, he speaks about, he takes 
the matzah that had been broken and it's pierced and it's striped and it was broken and it was wrapped in white linen and it was buried and then it was found again and then a reward was given to the one who found it and he took that bread and he said to his friends, this is my body and it has been broken for you. So take with me, take out your your. Uh, your unleavened bread, that is how this is most like the communion of old. The communion of old would have been unleavened, but it would have been a large piece of matzah striped and pierced as Jesus was. The Jews did that for thousands of years before Jesus was ever crucified. But he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And a short time later in the meal, he would have come to the third cup of wine at the Passover meal, the cup known as the cup of deliverance. Taking that and saying now that this, this cup of deliverance now recognizes, in a sense, Jesus is saying me as the deliverer and the cup of redemption is also called he is our redeemer and he took that cup and even likely then what it would have been would have been a fairly large chalice or a pitcher and then which he would have shared with uh, you know the 13 cups would have been mostly filled and to be taken in one glorious gulp. Um, but he then took that cup of redemption and now said that this, this has been renewed. And it is now the new covenant symbol of my blood shed for you. Uh, the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Does anybody have, you know, when it says, do this remembrance of me, anybody really remembering something or, or just, you know, something you want to testify to of, of God's grace from either the moment of salvation to this morning um, of God's work in your life? Anybody? Yes. Well, but for the rest, the rest to be benefited and blessed by what you say, you do. Thank you. For the past month, November was, was really hard, and, um, and this month is getting better, slow but sure, but I've been really sick, and it's just been spider bites and tooth infection and ear infection and just you name it, and so painful. Mm. And yet God's used it so huge because I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep for like mm -hmm. a month. And it was just wonderful to see how even though I was rubbing my face and crying and, and everything, I got to watch on my laptop your sermons that I had missed and a lot of different amazing things that he just spoke to okay. my heart okay. and carried me through and carried me through and held me. And he was amazing. Amen. And I just, Amen. I just know I never would have made it apart from him. Amen. Never. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, his grace is sufficient. Also showing that, you know, suffering, when, when God kind of puts us on our back, we have to slow down and listen more, don't we? And uh, it can be a real benefit. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, we'll come have the, the, the worship team uh, come back. And uh, you guys might have remembered a moment while I was talking I, when I was looking in the back and I was silent for several seconds because I was confirming I saw her back. I said, is that my, that is my wife. And so Michelle is here because she just wants to see all of you. And in this way, she'll be less exhausted from the process. Um, she's still having 
difficulty with talking much, so don't expect a lot of words from her, but um, obviously take the opportunity to, to greet her. Thanks for coming, honey. Uh, all right, God bless you all. All right, please stand with us for the closing hymn. <clears throat> Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Well, shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled. We low above the earth. Rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in the lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And brought us God's salvation, that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. Well, there's your instructions. Go tell about his birth and what hope you have in him. Have a great week. <laughs>